It's snakes that I feed on. I exaggerate. Sometimes I make changes to the subject. Nevertheless, I don't invent the whole picture. On the contrary, I find it ready made in nature by the need of unraveling. trying to, uh, to show the world just how much beauty is out there and to get people to see things differently. Which is, you know, a person looks at the sky, oh, look at all those dots, look at all that sky. He looks at the sky, starry night. Um, there's just some kind of beauty that sucks you into it, even though it doesn't look like a real night sky, but it feels more like any night sky. I don't want to use the word impression because then you think I'm thinking of impressionists, but there are feelings that he wanted to put into the color. So it wasn't just getting the brush stroke and getting the colors right. He wanted to have the feel in there as well, or what he felt. Um, he's not painting battles. He's painting sunflowers. And it's something that um, sparks us, I think. Those that looking up at the sky, that seeing the mysterious, invisible motion of the world, of the planet, of the clouds, the sky, and, and, and all of those things. They're, they're something that we can touch as well in our ordinary lives. He's so, he just seems so deep, and that's sort of what I am looking for in life, right? You don't want things to just kind of be surfacey. So I just feel like every painting you look at, every pencil sketch, all these different things about him are just all these puzzles and they fit together to make this this man that you know just did this beautiful art and I think that that's how we get to know him the very most is just by looking at what he's created because it's from inside of him and he just put it out there. You really have to understand how I consider art. To reach the edge of it you have to work long and hard. What I want and what I am aiming for is infernally difficult, and yet I believe I am not aiming too high. I want to make drawings that will touch people, either in figure or in landscape. In short, I want to get to a stage where it is said of my work, this man feels deeply and this man is sensitive. Despite my so-called roughness, you understand, or perhaps just because of it. So back in the spring, the Brighton Arts Council put out a call to all of its members to create um, a Van Gogh inspired piece for their September-October exhibit. And being new to the town and new to the council, I thought, awesome, that's going to be something I'm going to actually try to make a piece for an exhibit because I've never done anything like that before. Um, so the first painting that I thought of was this picture over here of uh, Van Gogh's irises. Uh, he's very known for his irises and his sunflowers. Um, and being a gardener, I guess I was kind of drawn to them. Um, but I didn't want to try to recreate a painting. The first, the first thing I thought of was, we'll make that vase come, alive, come to life, like make it 3D. Um, so I found this vase at an antique shop um, down in Prince Edward County, and I painted it up um, to look 
slightly like Van Gogh's painting there. And I um, painted each one of these flowers uh, that I got from Michael's, just a, a stem of, um, they were pink flowers that were on sale. And um, I painted each one to resemble the iris. Um, for me, it was, it was a really freeing uh, piece to do because I stopped making art for a long time because I can't make paintings look realistic. And I thought that that was um, meaning that I couldn't paint and I couldn't, I shouldn't bother if I couldn't make something look like a real ocean or, you know. Um, but Van Gogh's style isn't realistic. Like some people criticize his work to even, even look childlike. Um, and it just made me realize that if you're, if you're pinning yourself to these rules and you're being self-conscious and um, you're never going to create anything good, you have to just let all that go and put yourself into it. And um, maybe my style that's starting to develop isn't um, realistic looking, maybe it will never hang in a gallery, but it's me on paper, basically. I also, I think what, what appeals to me in the beginning when I first started painting was that um, if you're, do, if you're use, you know, the first time courses, you're usually painting with someone who's painting fairly realistically. And that was always a little bit tight to me, felt like a straitjacket. So once I started seeing artists who were painting wonky things, wild things, his sunflowers don't look like any. Well, actually, my dying sunflowers that I've got over here in a vase, they do look similar, but a lot of people don't paint them that way. They paint them these wonderful sunny flowers. So I like the way it, it gave me permission to free up, to, to, to change the image, to, to paint from someplace inside of me. It didn't have to be a representational painting. It could express more my feeling, and I certainly think that's what Van Gogh was doing in, in all of his work, using color to express his feeling, using line and, and all kinds of wonderful techniques. I started with this very bright yellow, couldn't even tell you what it is, and, and a bright purple, and uh, didn't really pay attention. There was no image going on, just mucking around. And of course, when you get the yellow and the purple, you start to get a really nice neutral gray, moldy purple color. So you start to bring out that kind of third element, and then I started layering uh, papers within that, that um, color range, so I've used handmade Japanese rice papers, uh, different types of, of uh, oriental papers, uh, bits and pieces from magazines, tissue paper, uh, old paintings of my own. I sometimes, works that I've done on paper, acrylic or watercolor, if they've been highly unsuccessful, uh, nothing, I think that's why I started collage, because I can't throw anything out. So they become part of another work of art. So I started adding small pieces from those paintings, and rather than let it get cutesy and create petals out of each piece of paper, uh, I'm now going to stop and go in with probably a watercolor crayon and start finding images, the big flower heads, and start working those up, create some depth with those, go in and find the petals, and start to uh, develop those. There's a painting that Van Gogh did, it's definitely in France. It's Orchards in Blossom with a view of something. I can't remember the exact French name of what the view was. But I liked, mind you, mine didn't come out looking that same way, but there's those trees in that particular piece are very strange. The main color be a lighter, it's like a bluey almost color, and it's kind of bizarre. But I really liked it because it was sort of bold and unexpected and, um, yeah, so, and like I said, mine literally looks nothing like that. But in, in looking at it and thinking that he just went for it, um, it, it makes me realize that as an artist, you just have to kind of do whatever it is you were thinking of. So for whatever reason, maybe the sun was shining extremely bright on those trees, and maybe they did look white that day. I have no idea. But that's how he painted them, and so they're very interesting. And so in doing this, I just kind of wanted to do it similar. It was like, it was a tree that I'd seen in the Quinty region, and um, yeah, it just, I wanted to be true to what I saw, and I feel like in that painting that he did, he was true to whatever it was he had seen in his own interpretation of it, and I just, I kind of drew from that. For the Van Gogh, I know he did a painting called Irises, 
and he had quite a bunch of irises in the front of his painting and they were basically blue and purpley color with yellow in the centers. So I did the same thing here with the glass and he had one white iris that stood out from the rest of them. And I always wondered why he did one white one and all the rest of them were the same color. And in my own mind, I always thought that, well, maybe that one iris represents him standing out from a crowd of people. And we all think we're sort of special, and I guess he probably thought it was special too, being able to do all these beautiful paintings. Anyways, um, so I thought I'd do the irises. I thought that was fairly um, good to do. I love irises. And what I liked about Van Gogh is too are all these little, he has all these tiny little, like little wavelets or something. That, that's his style of painting for that time. So I used this clear glass which has that same image uh, to represent his style. Um, Van Gogh paints trees with blue and orange and yellow and whites and browns and greens and the whole trunk is just a, 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 like a whole combination of color. I'm like, you can do that? <laughs> you know, I was just blown away and so that whole outside of the box thing I also learned from Van Gogh is that you look at a tree, it's brown. It can be all kinds of tones of brown but it's still brown. It could maybe be gray, you could add gray, but basically a real tree has all those natural colors. So that's the way I paint them. But um, I picked this picture because it's forcing me to paint color on a tree trunk. And I have a guide, <laughs> which is good, and I probably will copy it as quick, you know, as close to that as can, but I will never be able to go back. Uh, I looked at the books first, and you know, there's so many great pieces out there, like Starry Night, you know, you instantly think of that one because it's so famous, you know, you see it recreated everywhere, and then I thought, why not do something a bit different, something that people might not know, so then I looked and I saw Bulb Field, and I thought, like, you know, that's really interesting, and it was originally really different, like the sky was different, and it might not be as colorful, so I thought, why not add some Sophie into it, and just change it up a bit, and then I found a portrait of someone he did, and I thought, that's... It's really dark the way he uses colors, and I thought that was really interesting. So I thought, you know, combine the two, see what happens, and I really liked it. So, do you have the uh, sketch that you have? Yeah. So this lady right here. So I thought I'd incorporate her somewhere in the piece. I'm not sure yet, but I have different colors that I came up with too. So it depends on, I guess, what I'm feeling. I don't know. Maybe a bit different, like some blue to add to the sky. But I like her black and white because it's really like just. Plain, and then you have like the bold background. I think I didn't notice as much the texture he uses and the color. Like with this, when I looked at the piece, he had like blue there, blue there, and then I was like, I look closer, and there's some orange there, and I'm like, that's crazy. Like, why would you put orange there? They're blue. And then I thought, you know, it actually goes, it goes together. So that's something I wouldn't have thought of. But now, now you know, why not put some color in there? Why not try something different? And that's I think what he did. I'm a fiber artist, and the medium that I have is wool. I work with recycled wool, I go to the thrift shops, I buy up old skirts, old sweaters, and my passion is to, first of all, I usually wash them when I get home, because you never know, so wash them, and then I shred them, I cut out the pockets and the linings, and then I dye them. That's another absolute passion of mine, is to play in the dye pot. My husband used to come up to me and say, oh, are you cooking, dear? Oh, no, you're dying. Yes, I'm dying. Sorry, no supper tonight. <laughs> That's that's what we do. Plaids are, are fun and um, because you can scrunch them up they make nice clouds or they can make a beautiful rock. So the medium, uh, hooking, you use a simple tool which is like a crochet hook. They come in different sizes, very tiny. And the, the backing is uh, linen or burlap. And the simple process is you have a piece of yarn, a piece of thread, and you pull it in and you pull it up through. So it's just a matter of a simple mechanical pulling up a loop from the back to the top. So I have already done one half of a potato here. I'm in the process of doing another potato. I have my prototype right here which is a reasonable facsimile of a potato because that's what I'm doing. I'm inspired by the potato eaters there. Simpl simple life 
not having much, but I think not desiring much either. The potato eaters came to my mind because I always think that's such a beautiful painting. I love the hands of the people. They seem very peaceful. All they have is potatoes and a bit of a brew. And I think they're looking very peaceful of their work that they did and now they have the, the rewards of, of a simple life. Do you think Van Gogh saw that too? I do. I very much believe that he did. Yes, I do. Because he couldn't draw with such passion if he could only see the manic side of life. Uh, my name is Leanne Snow. My medium, I think, is best described as eclectic right now. I'm really throwing myself into the recycling work. And oddly enough, the pop cans are the thing, the popper beer cans, that shiny metal is the thing that is what I'm doing most of these days, the new thing for me. I wanted to stop throwing parts away. So for instance, the the can I cut leaves from for the tree that was at Lola's, my Japanese maple. Then I had, um, so I would cut the leaves that were useful for me out of it, and then I would get rid of the rest of the can. But one day, I stacked them all up like this, and I looked at them, and I went, Oh, God, that's pretty! <laughs> so I started um, figuring out a way to see sky or a field of gold. I love art of people because even if it's not actually based off of someone, just there's always a story behind it because you know, like everyone has some sort of story. But also because, I don't know, it's just, I actually have no idea. It just kind of was like, oh, Van Gogh. And instantly it's like Star Night, the sunflowers, the field with the crows. And so originally I was going to do something kind of like Sophie's and like something with a person. And then I was like, well, Van Gogh is like a big part of his art. Like it was him. And then I was like, well, art is a person. And then I was like, put the art on the person. And then it just went from there. Well, my name is Rebecca Drake. And I am what I call an intuitive artist. Um, I prefer to work in watercolor or pastel. I... Uh, I don't, you know, sit down and have an image in my mind when I sit down to do the work. I just start throwing color on the paper. And a lot of times I'll throw the color on the paper, throw it in the corner, and then come back a couple days later and look at it, and then I begin to see images. And I just allow those images to come out and to lead me, um, you know, what they want to say. I'll, I'll write my request on the corner. Uh, I put uh, Vincent Van Gogh, born March 30, 1853. Thank you for expressing here for Brittany Aller Inshaw's documentary about you. Thank you. And uh, then I, uh, I say a prayer of thanks and gratitude and uh, that uh, all information that comes through be for the highest healing, the highest purpose, and the highest truth of all that will see it. And uh, then I just kind of concentrate, ground myself, feel it. If I can't explain it any more than that, and then just allow, it's like a ball of energy builds up in front of me, and then when it's ready to go, I just kind of let it flow down my arm, and I just kind of <laughs> scribble everywhere. Oh dear. That was unexpected. <laughs> yes, it was. Isn't that interesting that it happened right then? <laughs> uh, and then I just I let it scribble on there, and then I just kind of allow the images to start to come out and just play with it as I go. I'm just begun doing the color around him, um, which I'm I'm. My goal is to capture the essence of who he was was and what he was trying to express, what he was trying to share with us. Um, there's really the only the one image that's really come out. It's it's his heart, and it's like love was everything to him, and to to share that um, that warmth, that glory, um, and that's a, I'm about all where I am right now with that. <laughs> I use generally I'm very controlled even when I do abstracts. Um, I do a lot of um, very detailed work that's very controlled with colored pencil. And even when I do acrylics, it's still very controlled. So I, I felt that this would, might liberate me a little bit more. So that's why I took on the project. It would, I thought it would just push me into some areas I wasn't comfortable with. And I mean, I really struggled over the starry night. Like that is, and I know that that's not how 
uh, he particularly did it, but just to even let myself go enough to um, do the brush strokes like that. Because I thought, this is going to be ugly, this is going to be ugly, this is going to be ugly. <laughs> but, uh, so, you yeah, know, that was a bit of a struggle. Um, and because it's such a big piece, and to get the big brush strokes, I used gesso to mix into uh, the exterior house paint. Some of the exterior house paint stuff is very thick anyway. Uh, but I was using like so much gesso, I'm just not getting the thick pesto kind of effect that I wanted, so I thought I had to put it off. Use what I have and I'll do what I do and it'll be as it will be. <laughs> His bedroom was what actually where the colors had started me off because he had butter yellow, vermilion red, um, he had the green of the window, the, the violet walls, the pink and green turquoise of the floor. So all those colors, that was actually my starting point. And now I'm trying to get the movement going, the round movement that will get, um, I'm calling this piece um, the artist's maelstrom. And so a maelstrom is something that moves um, uh, quite actively. I mean, he had such a turbulent, his mind, his mind would never stop. He painted, he painted, he painted from morning to evening. He painted like an, uh, one particular painting, I think, of, of um, a woman. It, it, he painted it in one hour and it was a masterpiece. So he was obsessed. He was obsessed. Don't believe a word of it. Isn't it emotion, sincerity, or feelings for nature that guides? And these emotions are sometimes so strong that one works without feeling, that one is working when there are times when each touch of paint leads to the next, and the relationship between them is like words in a speech or a letter. When you read, a, read what people write, it's so gushy, so florid, or it's extremely dark and they say he was this mad person who created like an almost like an idiot savant it was just not right so that it was between two extremes and there was never or I didn't see a connection of the two put together to see somebody who might say some people call it tormented as opposed to passionate and at what point does it become obsession Um, Van Gogh's mental health is hard to talk about because it is all in retrospect now, but it is fascinating to think about it and to talk about it because, for instance, my son Caleb, who has autism, his very favorite painting is Starry Night by Van Gogh. And so, to me, that, for starters, is fascinating that a nine-year-old boy with autism has a favorite painting. Most nine-year-old boys couldn't tell you one painting from another. But my son is fascinated with Van Gogh, and so the more I looked into Van Gogh's paintings, the more I could almost see why. And for instance, Starry Night has the swirls in the sky, and the, and the moon is kind of has like this haze around it. And a lot of people with autism have, um, they have like a, a sensory issue. So it'll either be they hear things that nobody else hears, or they smell everything, or taste bothers them. And some people with autism, don't see things the way we see them. So like, I look at a face and I see eyes and nose and mouth. Where someone with autism sees a face and they see like color tones and they see shapes and it's different to them. So when I see Starry Night and when I think about a kid with autism, it's like maybe that's how my son sees the night sky. Maybe it is all swirls and, and a blur and it's beautiful but it's not what we would necessarily think of as the night sky. And so for me, looking at something like that and thinking about how there are 
those who speculate that Van Gogh might have had autism, I could, I could totally see that because a lot of his paintings are like that where you look at it and you think, yeah, I, I see what he's painting. And it's not super abstract. It's impressionistic and, it's, and to me, impressionistic is, is very autistic because that they are, children and grown-ups with autism are taking in impressions of everything and trying to make it make sense. And so I could sort of see that in a lot of Van Gogh's work. And then as far as him being bipolar or manic or something like that, I could also see that because, I mean, he cut his ear off. <laughs> so that's a bit of a manic thing to do. And I think that, like, um, as an emotional person, um, I know that when I'm feeling super stressed and I'm going to punch a hole through the wall, that if I pull out a canvas and just start painting, I'd feel a lot better. And sometimes I'll do a painting and somebody will see it and go, wow, that's a little darker than usual. And I'm like, is it really? Because I know in my mind, it was like, the options were paint that picture or light my hair on fire. <laughs> so I, I love looking at his work thinking that he maybe did have some mental problems. Um, because I think without people, with mental problems or people without autism or any of those things that our world has the potential to be fairly boring. We need those people who put a stick in the spokes of normal life and kind of shake it up and it's beautiful. There's a couple of uh, art documentaries that I looked at and some of them were quite critical and very obviously discussed his mental state and, and all of that. And the fact that he probably had epilepsy and was having seizures. And then you look at paintings like Starry Night and how you've got this, this, these lines that just vibrate. Something kind of like Emily Carr has kind of some of those images with some of her trees um, in the forest. And I wonder if some of those flashes, light or whatever images that may have been part of his epilepsy or his seizures may have been, he may have been able in some capacity to translate that into the painting because they really do just vibrate. Well, as you know, my, my background is mental health, and I say um, maybe, probably, who cares? <laughs> um, we, we're just, we really love to label. I think, uh, not exactly, because I think he wanted to just show his emotion more like, because if he had a disability, like, it's not only that, but you just, you want to get out there, you want to express what you're feeling, and maybe for him, because he didn't have, because he had his disability, he couldn't say it as much, so he had to find a way to put it across out to the world, other than just saying it, so then, I guess, art came to him. Um, I think we all have something slightly off about us, um, and specifically artists, because they're more honest about it. Um, uh, the kind of average citizen who, who might not consider themselves a creative person uh, might be more closed-lipped about how they actually feel about things or struggles they may have, but an artist can't help but, but put that out there because it's them and it becomes their artwork. Yeah. But see, the other thing is, is most of our people who are really closed off from like other people also make the best art. And like, let's say he did have autism, that's basically what it is, is you can't communicate with other people properly, so I find that a lot of people who can't do that can communicate even better through their art. A friend of mine once said that the only difference between crazy people and eccentric people is, is that although they both live in a world that is really a different reality in many ways, the crazy person expects everybody else to live in their reality, and the eccentric doesn't. What am I in the eye of most people? A non-entity or an eccentric? Or a disagreeable fellow? Someone who has no position in society or will ever have one? In short, the lowest of the low. Well, assuming everything were exactly so, then I would like to show through my work what is in the heart of such an eccentric, such a non-entity. This is my ambition. In the poorest hovel, in the garbage corner, I can see paintings or drawings, and as if compelled by an irresistible urge, my soul goes out in that direction. The have-to part, it, it is within us. 
And uh, what I respect, and I think maybe what a lot of us respect about Vincent was that he he knew exactly who he was. He, <laughs> you know, the, there's always this speculation about his internal world. We can't know, but but we might place ourselves in that position and, you know, wonder what is the internal dialogue? Um, and maybe there was a lot less self-consciousness and a lot more, maybe a lot less second-guessing. Maybe just the, the drive to follow the idea. I find that in times in my life where uh, things are kind of just chugging along, I don't get anything done as far as paintings go. Cause it's like, and things like, it's just day in, day out, same things are happening, same things are happening. And then all of a sudden, something happens and it's like, woo, I got a paint. And, and it's, it kind of pushes you to do it because you need some outlet. And, um, you know, I love to dance and choreograph, but that's not really always optional. And so then for me, to be able to just paint something, is is the best way to get out that that big emotion, whatever it is. I think great art comes out of great passion, out of great desires, out of great emotions, out of great events, out of tremendous stuff, awesome stuff. And awesome could be good or bad. It comes when somebody is completely in that moment, completely involved. You lose your whole sense of self. You are in there, you are feeling it, you are experiencing it, and that produces the art. Art comes from the side of the brain that doesn't have language. You have your left side of your brain is the masculine side of your brain where um, you have your mathematical, logical, language self. And the right side of the brain is your intuitive movement, uh, romantic, uh, line, linear, shapes, light. That's all, that's the right side of your brain. So if you, if you get your, it's, it's learning, when you're learning to draw art, you start in your left side of the brain, learning the rules, this and that and the other thing. And then as you're doing it, it's like the right side of your brain is finally starting to get in there and go, oh, you're going to let me draw? Oh, you're going to let me play? And it's, it's a learning, it's like when you let that side of you come out and play, then the left side of your brain kind of goes, oh, that's kind of cool, maybe you're not such an idiot, <laughs> you know? And then, the, and then there becomes this beautiful thing where it, it goes back to the logical, let's think about it a little bit, and then let's go and let's feel it out and see how it feels, if that color feels good or whatever. Okay, well, let's take that back into the logical. All right, well, what do we need to do there? Okay, well, that, I think that might work. Let's try a little bit of that. And, it's, and that's what creating art is all about, which, look at the infinity sign. <laughs> you get that beautiful balance. And it's a balance between your intellect and your emotional self. Sister Wendy, she's a, an art historian from England and made, probably 20 years ago did these art videos. They were on BBC, I guess, and she was talking about he has a painting of his room where there's the bed and the chair and all this. And this kid, she was critiquing it and saying, well, he's closed in, he's cut himself off from the world, that, that the way he positioned the room, the way he positioned the bed was very uh, indicative of his mental state and all of that. And I just thought, well, maybe he was just painting his room. Maybe he just thought, this is my, my cozy bedroom, I'm just going to paint the room and, the way I want to. And I think to put some kind of psychological meaning sometimes to what we paint or others paint is a mistake. Even his pencil sketches, uh, like his early pencil sketches are they're like almost realistic and then just a little bit off which is cool because it's sort of like you can see like his like what I, I it's not like he has real fake work but when people think of Van Gogh they think of his very bright and moving paintings so like his older stuff, you can see these little sparks of sort of what he's building into. I should like to paint portraits that are sent related to the people living then will seem like apparitions. 
So I am not seeking to achieve this through photograph likeness, but through the expression of emotions, using our modern knowledge and taste for color as a means of expression and elevation of character. And I should tell you that these days I am endeavoring to find a way of working with the brush without using stippling or anything else, just a variety of stroke. One day you will see what I mean. I think that Vinny had in his mind something that he wanted to accomplish, but the technology wasn't there yet. I don't think the combinations of the oils or the paints or the textures or the brushes or the canvas allowed him to paint what he saw. And I think part of his frustration was trying to get that right, whatever it was in his mind. The more you grow as an artist, the more your opinions change. So then maybe he thought, why not move on to something else, something I haven't touched yet. And once I conquer that, why not something else again and again and again, and just learn more as I go. We were left with lots of wonderful masterpieces because he uh, was, it was a very individualistic style. And his brush strokes were very, uh, the impasto effect of the brush strokes, uh, that thick paint, uh, almost sculptural. And he, he went about his work with such energy and almost like a manic uh, expression that when we look at these pieces, you can see the liveliness of them. And that's really what I'm trying to express. I'm trying to kind of express the liveliness of the strokes and the brush strokes. You know, he had different strokes that he would use, but when you step away from the painting, you know, like four or five feet, it's a beautiful comp you know, composition. And, um, and that struck me, uh, gave me permission to kind of let go. I, I, I started to get into a little bit of a funk where I had to have everything like right to the detail of uh, like exact painting, so to speak. And um, Van Gogh showed me that I can be a little bit looser uh, with the strokes and things like that and still come out and it still looks like a field or a tree or or a house or whatever without having like just right down to the feather <laughs> you know if I had to make a bird and so that was kind of liberating for me as well. And I think also when you're looking at something that reveals the brush stroke you're looking at the hand you can feel the motion in your own arm it, it's a it's a much more personal style. I've always had trouble with heavy brush strokes and I don't know if it's because I'm too cheap with the paint to layer it on, but I'm hoping with this because I admire painters who can just take a palette and just smear it on because it is really impressive and effective. And the same with taking those colors, those um, analogous colors side by side, they really start to vibrate. So. That's another thought for me is to get in with some heavier paints and just put some lines in and just see what happens in terms of the image if it starts to vibrate and give me the feeling that I want. It's acrylic and I'm doing collage so if it doesn't work I can always go in with another color, I can collage over top. So it's, it's, it's always a bit of an experiment. Bingo's thought process is something I think that I do think about more than his style. It's interesting actually, it's kind of this like, it's like a teeter-totter. Um, where on one end of it, I'm, I'm looking at every little brush stroke and like, oh wow, I just thought that was that color, but now I'm looking really close and it's like, you can see all these little bits in there. And, and so it's really fascinating that way. And then on the, on the other side of that, Dieter Totter is, is me being so fascinated by how he was mentally and the fact that we don't really know and just kind of going through his thought process and, and, and trying to analyze that. And, and sort of take from both what I feel is my version of that art. I know for some people it's a point of inspiration. Like, they always painted roses and they were good or whatever, but then one day they saw sunflower and it just hit, which obviously I don't think is what he did because I've never seen a painting of a rose, but you know. But then for some people it just kind of happens. I don't know. I think for the most part it's an inspiration thing because I know if you ask most artists there's just one piece that just changed their life. Like it could just be a painting of like a bird but it just opened that door and there's no going back through. <laughs>
The question of suffering in art is, is significant. We romanticize art. Is that a bad thing? I don't know. I don't know about the romance of suffering. I don't think that, in my heart of hearts, I don't believe that it is necessary. I do believe that suffering takes us to a very revealing place in ourselves because it calls on our bare bones of resourcefulness and and we mine the depths of ourselves when we're suffering and and I don't think that that can help but influence our work so the passion is there um, not not to the extent of Van Gogh a starving artist although believe me it is a starving job to sell your your work I have sold different uh, mats for the floor and most people, and I don't expect them to do it, I like it if people like my colors and like my work. I'm happy with that and um, there are some teachers that say you should charge X number per square foot. So even, I'm just bringing up this little mat again, this thing should maybe sell because it's hand dyed and I made my own pattern, three or four hundred dollars, well maybe I'm worth that. But people don't pay that. So if I sell them for $55, they are really happy and so am I because I get a little bit more money to buy more stuff. And they are happy because they have a handmade thing that they will cherish. Because most people that have received mats as gifts or just um, even purchased from me, say, oh, I still have that on the floor. So that's the satisfaction I get out of it. So I'm not a starving artist but you don't get rich from it, I don't. But I think the starving part means different things to different people. Because there are people who are wealthy who paint beautiful pictures. And I think that there are so many elements to being a starving artist that um, you have to define starving. And so like for me, I, I can buy paint, I can, I can buy canvases, sometimes those are the cheap ones, but I can buy that stuff. And but for me, a lot of times, the starving part comes in where, um, like, I'm, I'm 30 now, but I feel like it's only been the last few years that I'm actually getting to know myself. And so for me, I'm starving to just be a real person. I'm just, I just want to be genuine and I want to be somebody that people can count on. And so, in a lot of ways, that sort of, that drives me a little bit and like, and for instance, being at the point of feeling like I'm going to have a nervous breakdown, okay, I'm just going to paint a picture instead. To me, it's like pouring out my real self, which is starving for um, like something really tangible. Yeah, it's uh, the starving artist, uh, I think, is a part of uh, to hold art down because uh, it's the creativity of artists that are, are the base of the changing of any society. And uh, if you think you get a struggle and it's going to be hard, then half of your energy is going to go into that into, into, instead of creating. I don't believe for a second that anyone wants at the end of their life to say, well, that was comfortable and complacent. I think that we look back on the most important moments in our life and we recognize that they were the worst and best of times. Not just the best of times, but they were important in our life because they gave us an experience that we had not had before. We expanded, if you will, our pendulum of experience.
Now I'm all about the balance, but maybe the balance isn't just staying in the middle. Maybe the balance is how far you swing this way and how far you swing this way. And I think it takes a lot of courage to spend a little time on the edges of, of life, whereas sometimes it can be very uncomfortable. Sometimes, dear brother, I know so well what I want. I am quite able to do without God, both in my life and my paintings. But what I cannot do without, unwell as I am, is something greater than myself, which in my life the power to create. And I think that's why the clergy part, the, the marriage part and whatever, didn't work out because that wasn't creating, that was conforming, that was doing, towing the line with no way to get out of it. And in this case, with the art, he could. Or actually, he could get more into it, lose himself inside it. I, I do consider myself a creative person. So I, uh, I would do things like refinish a table or turn a sled into a bar bag or things like that. And, uh, or even painting a room. I would find painting a room enjoyable. Um, and I, now I realize it was because I just liked painting. If, if I'm not doing this or I'm not painting, then I'm decorating the house and I'm moving things that I'm going into my kitchen and I see my colorful cups and I shift things around and I think there needs to be a red or a yellow or yeah so I'm, I, I've been doing this all my life so while I'm not doing it directly with artwork I'm always doing it in my, my environment. I, I may not be painting painting but I might be doing something within that creative realm. It doesn't matter if it's drawing, doesn't matter if it's just you know putting some nail polish on, you know, I always have to, it's just fun and it gets away from reality a bit because you can do what you want and just be free with it, so I like that. When I was a kid, I used to go to church with a girlfriend of mine and I loved the stained glass in the churches and that's what attracted me to it in the first place. And um, then I've been at this now, I guess for about 15 years altogether and um, I just love doing it. I find it very relaxing, enjoyable. I sell a lot. I've had a lot of people ask me to make panels and windows for them and um, mostly in this area and um, I just finished one a bamboo panel for somebody and that came out really nice and um, I just enjoy it. I love it. I love color. I really love color. You're never satisfied with the piece you just did because you're always thinking, you know, I got to do the next one because I just learned that I could do that differently or, you know, you discover something. So I think that also can drive your need to paint as well as that, oh, I've got something I got to try. And, uh, and so, yeah, I don't think I have the same drive as Van Gogh, but um, I certainly understand the pleasure and the creativity of painting. I think there's, um, there's value in it, and I think we were created to be creative. And so there's a fulfillment, uh, an, your own personal fulfillment that you have when you um, do what it is you were made to do. So that's exciting for me. <laughs> Aren't we born artists? <laughs> I think we are. I think that um, for the time I could hold a pencil, I knew I was an artist, and then all the rest of the roles that we take on in life were layered on on top of that. The need, the need to create for me, um, in a lot of ways, comes out of just being a stay-at-home mom, and and feeling the need to accomplish something. So, not to say that raising kids who are critical thinkers and socially aware and all that, not to say that that isn't a job with um, satisfaction, but sometimes for me, because I'm I'm sort of goal-driven, so for me. Having a painting that I want to start and work on and finish, it's like, woo, I did something. And, and it helps me to feel accomplished. And so then if it's not a painting, it's, it's sometimes it's baking. I'll, I'll bake and bake and bake for like five days straight. Put it all in the freezer and then think, that's awesome. Now I have cookies I can give to people if I want. And, and to me, that's a creative outlet. I've always been a really crafty person. And when I was a kid, I was always doing something. Um, I always have to be creating something and I went for quite a few years without doing that and found that it was something I was really missing in my life and I need to start doing it again to, to fulfill that other part of me. I write or play every single day. 
Um, I like to write the equivalent of haikus because they're so hard um, to stay within the spirit. I don't count syllables or stuff. I, I try to count the emotions or the concepts, but you have to. Whether it's good or not is something else, but you do have to. Would you be able to go without creating art for a couple months? Oh, oh no. No. <laughs> no. I mean, I have before, but I don't know. It's funny. For the longest time, from about, I want to say grade 7 to grade 9, is I would just get random spurts. Like, I wouldn't paint. I wouldn't draw. Like, I doodle, but I wouldn't seriously do anything for, like, weeks at a time. And then one day I'd randomly be like, I'm going to paint this. And then I would just go for, like, a month and just every night I would do something and I would stop again but it, it's gotten more consistent now but no I can't go without it and sure we get discouraged we go into jury shows and we don't get in and we don't get in what's the point point? and you walk past your studio and oh, I'll just turn on the light and next thing you know you're, you're painting again or you're rummaging through something and, and it sparks an interest again even with making this piece or making this film um, is the first thing I thought about when I woke up this morning and started putting together clips and it, once a project gets into your head you're kind of stuck with it and even if you're not physically working on it you're kind of chipping away at it all the time. I'll tell you we were in Europe for just a week, a month and I didn't bring my rug hooking with me because well you have to have, we were going to warm places and cold places and you can't bring scissors on board and to bring all this, this, this hoop it, it, it would just take up too much room. So I didn't bring any hooking with me. And I'll tell you, the first thing I did when I came home was go and look at my stash. And oh yes, good, it's still here. And then of course I started to think about the Van Gogh and the potatoes and so on right away. And that's the first thing I did. I do need to have my eye hook when we uh, drive to Florida. I hook in the car. Um, I always bring my, I, sometimes I don't use my rug hooking I, because when we go to the grandchildren I'm too busy. But I have to have it there as a security blanket, almost. I, I, I have my hooking always with me. There's a beauty in people who, who just see things as they are, and they just take it as it is. It's just black and white. And then, but then there's the other beauty where um, someone's mind deconstructs what they're looking at and what they're seeing. And like one of my first paintings I really was proud of in the last few years um, was a painting of my neighbor's tree, the name that lives across the road, because it was beautiful fall day, the trees were so beautiful, and then there was this crazy windstorm, and the tree was like almost blowing like parallel to the ground, it was so cool, and I ran out and took a picture, and then I painted it, and it was like, it was just so cool, I just felt like I'd captured something from, from our life, and uh, I just want, I loved that I could create this amazing thing that made me run out in this huge windstorm to take a picture of it. And um, yeah, it makes me happy to feel like I'm, I'm getting stuff done. It makes me happy to know that there's people looking at my paintings in their house and that it maybe inspires them and you know brings some color into their, into their day. And it just makes me feel really good. Yeah, and so what if I have boxes and boxes and boxes of paintings? I enjoyed creating every one of them. That's what it's all about. The fact is that sometimes I feel too weak to cope with the way things are and had one has to be cleverer or richer and younger to be a success. Fortunately for me, my heart is no longer set on any sort of triumph and all I look for in paintings is a way of getting through life. I feel a personal connection with Vincent and I think a lot of other artists do as well and I've discovered that through the course of filming this. and. He writes in his letters about being unsatisfied with his life. He compares himself to being a caged bird and watching all the other birds migrate off and he's stuck in his cage and the other birds say to him, um, oh look at that fellow, he's comfortable, he has everything he needs in his cage, he's so warm and has his food and he's well taken care of. And the little bird in the cage, Vincent, is longing to be able to go off with the others and be free and do something that he feels that he's made for. Um, and it wasn't until he accepted that uh, art was his passion and he needed art in his life that he really took off and he really 
um, got to be his own person. It kind of got him out of that cage. And I think a lot of creative, pe creative people, including myself, have felt that way before, where you just feel so bottled up that you have something to give, but you don't know what it is, um, and your daily work isn't fulfilling enough, and kind of the daily drudgings of life isn't enough. Um, there's something else you got to put out there, and that's that's that innate need to create coming out that you just have to make something, put yourself into something. It's um, creating art isn't about doing it for anyone else. It's about doing it for yourself. And then if other people like it, that's wonderful, because um, it's nice to get your message out there and communicate an idea. Um, but if you're doing it for other people, you may as well be working in a factory making a car. Like, you can't, you can't, art can't be like on a conveyor belt where you're going to turn out 20 necklaces by the end of the week or make 12 quilts for Christmas time or you can do that to make some money if you need to or to, to pay for some of your supplies. But at the end of the day, your most fulfilling pieces come because you just wanted to do them and for no one else. Before the starry night, before the colors bright, there was a time of dark. Years of somber hue, demons taking their due, smothering the spark. Broad strokes straight chasing each other across the skies, sharpness and contours of the face, tormented shadows behind gleaming blue eyes, weary of running the race. Paths to be traveled, life skeins to unravel, fate clamors with strident voice. A husband, a merchant, a clergyman, an artist, each strand the impossible choice. First the sketch and then the colors, with lines of clash and conflict. They speak, they demand, they seduce, they afflict. But Vincent wasn't mad. The church put out its call with dogma wanting all, and Vincent did his best. He listened with his heart for the spirit of Emir Encore. The clergy failed the test. Colors of unimaginable depth, textures defying rigid canvas, thick maelstroms of violent tones, drawing to the madness that is art, that is passion. Sounding out frustration's cry, the despair overwhelms, the demons embrace, at the end, the belated release. His was the prophecy and his was the charge to use colors as never before. A painter of the future, the like of which had never been seen, and he was, after death, the one.